Welcome back to Seeker Plus and our series on the ISS. This is episode two. If you missed the first episode where I geek out about how the space station got up there in the first place, be sure to check that out. There's a wild fact involving Pizza Hut I bet most of you didn't know in that episode. Now we're going to turn our attention to the ISS today, and there's no one better to tell us exactly what's going on up there right now than, well, people who are actually up there right now. Astronauts Shane Kimbrough and Tama Pesquet agreed to talk to us for this series because, well, NASA volunteered them and there's not really anywhere else for them to go. They're sort of stuck with me. Unlike you, you chose to be here, so hey, thanks for that. Shane and Tama aren't just steely-eyed missile men capable of performing complex tasks under pressure in a hostile environment while speaking Russian, they're also scientists. The ISS is, after all, a laboratory unlike any other on Earth, where experiments can be conducted in microgravity. Several of the modules are dedicated laboratories, and astronauts have compared the station's research capabilities to world-class universities. Science isn't just done inside the station, but on the outside, too. The station's exterior can host 20 different experiments to study things like new materials and particle physics. Research conducted on the ISS has affected you, even if you don't know it. A couple of the ones that we've worked on recently that uh, you know I, I kind of like are one. Uh, we do a lot of medical research up here, and we're just you know we're partnered with the researchers and we we help them out with their data. One of the ones that we've done recently is worked with uh, the du Duquesne's muscular dystroph dystrophy, and some of the protein crystal growths that we've had on board the space station have proven to be a treatment for that. Uh, and now they're I think phase three clinical trials now. Um, and it looks like it can reduce, you know, about half, uh, or it can slow down about uh, the growing potential for that by half. So that's going to, you know, prolong pe people's life that have that disease. That's pretty special to be involved in things like that. Other things that we really get involved in are taking pictures of planet Earth and natural disasters um, that happen, you know, all over our planets, unfortunately. But wildfires and uh, hurricanes and things recently that we've been able to photograph with cameras from the inside of the space station with us taking the picture as well as cameras on the outside. So we can help the first responders. We can help, you know, other uh, weather agencies in those kind of situations predict things and, and help other people on the ground. All told, there have been about 3,000 experiments performed aboard the ISS. The lion's share have been focused on biology and biotechnology, and have spurred advances like the ability to better test saliva for active viruses. Now, I don't think I need to go into why that's a huge contribution in this day and age. The astronauts and cosmonauts on board the ISS have explored how a Bose-Einstein condensate behaves in microgravity, and how to grow crystals out of proteins for possible cancer treatments. With so much science that's been conducted on board, I wanted to know if Shane and Tama had any personal favorite experiments they'd witnessed or been a part of. You're going to do fluid physics one day, you're going to do medicine or biology uh, the next day. So, so that's, that's pretty special for us every day. Um, I think one that we actually really like that's uh, ongoing right now in that very module, uh, it's called Plant Habitat 4, and we're, we're growing some plants on board the space station. Um, because when we, when we venture further and deeper into space, we'll need to be able to grow our own food. Uh, so we have to study this on board the space station. And by doing so, we also identify how to make plants maybe more, uh, more resistant to to difficult conditions where water is scarce, when they're, they're liking what they usually get from the natural environment. Because as you can imagine up here, um, it's, it's actually difficult. There's no soil, you have to water the plant. It's, everything becomes much more complicated. But nevertheless, uh, we were able to, with the help from the scientists, to grow some uh, the red hatch chili peppers that are actually really good looking. We haven't tasted them yet, um, but we like to look at them. We like to interact with them because it also reminds us of nature on the ground. There's not so many natural elements around us on board the space station, but this is one, and that's why everybody likes it. They themselves are also an experiment. Some of the greatest minds in history have dreamed of the day humanity spreads beyond the Earth, and some, like Stephen Hawking, have even suggested it'll be necessary for the survival of our species. If we're ever going to become a spacefaring species, we need to understand what prolonged trips in space do to us. Now, I know, gravity seems like a drag, doesn't it? It always gets me down. Sorry. But weightlessness seems so much more appealing until you realize that there are things our body needs gravity for. Thanks to millions of years of evolving to survive on the Earth's surface, some systems in our body really rely on it to function properly. 
Thanks to the first extended trips to space, we learned that microgravity can take a serious toll on the human body in a surprisingly short amount of time. Astronauts lose an average of 1% of their bone density per month in space. Muscles atrophy faster, too, so ISS astronauts have to exercise for two and a half hours every day to keep their strength up. Microgravity also causes fluids to shift up into their heads, putting pressure on their eyes and potentially hurting their vision. And of course, there's going to the bathroom. How does one, you know, go when there is no down? I asked social media what questions they had for Shane and Tama, and unsurprisingly, this was the most common response I got. Now, normally, I wouldn't ask these very important space scientists for the dirty details, but as it happens, the ISS just got a brand spanking new toilet. It cost $23 million to design and build, and it's supposed to be more compact and efficient, making it better suited for future crewed missions to the moon and beyond. So I asked about what this new toilet means for astronauts on the go. That's a great question, and the new toilet is called the Universal Waste Management System, and the universal really is key there because we want to not just use it here. We're using it as a test bed here on the station, but we're going to use it on future missions to, uh, that are going to the moon and maybe even to Mars. But it's going well. We've been testing it out for one week now, uh, and I've been the sole tester. Um, so uh, <laughs> things are going pretty well with that. Uh, and, you know, and it's great. The upgrade is kind of a, you know, it's smaller overall, smaller and lighter, which is great. Um, and so we We've reduced the system almost by over half, actually, um, with the whole thing. That if you look at the toilet side by side with the current toilet, um, it looks bigger, but the whole overall system is much smaller. So we've figured out a way to do that, which we're going to need if we're going to go in a smaller capsule, like we're intending to go to the moon here in the next few years. There, I asked the very important people that I admire about Dookie. For you, I hope you're happy. And it'll also bring us to the future of the space station later, but we'll get to that in a bit. Okay, now that we're done with that bit, we're going to get off the pot. There are more concerns about prolonged space travel than what it does to our physical health. We also need to examine what it does to our mental state. I'm sure I don't have to tell you this, but staying cooped up in a confined space for an extended period of time can really take a toll on a person's psyche. Astronauts on the ISS typically spend six months on the station at a time, and the only privacy they get is when using the aforementioned commode. Some astronauts, like Scott Kelly and Christina Cook, have spent close to a year on the station in a single stretch. Scott Kelly was a particularly useful case because he has an identical twin brother, Mark, who also was a former astronaut. I bet they have the proudest parents. Mark served as a control subject on Earth, allowing NASA to better understand how a year in space affected Scott's mind and body. Scott's body experienced stress due to oxygen deprivation, more inflammation, and his genes expressed themselves differently. Most of that went away once Scott was back on Earth, but about 7% of his genes didn't return to normal, and they could have a long-term effect on his immune system, DNA repair, and bone formation. As for his cognitive and psychological health, Scott's test scores in space were consistent throughout his whole year up there, which is a good sign. Interestingly, they dipped for six months when he got back to Earth, but the pain and difficulty that comes with readjusting to Earth's gravity may have something to do with it. Based on what they've seen, NASA is developing techniques to keep astronauts in a good headspace, like VR simulations of relaxing environments, and new LED lighting systems that keep astronauts on a 24-hour rhythm. Getting good sleep is really important for somebody's mental health, and it can be a little disorienting when you see 16 sunrises and sunsets in a day, like Shane and Tama do. Future Mars explorers will have to deal with the planet's day, which is 37 minutes longer than Earth's, but... To me, that sounds like heaven. 37 minutes is, what, like four snooze buttons worth of extra sleep? That's perfect for me. Company can also make a long journey more bearable, especially if you can't download podcasts, wink wink. And if it wasn't clear, Shane and Tama were selected in part because of their personalities and their dynamic with each other and other crew members. NASA is refining how to pick the best crew possible to make sure the ISS doesn't become like one of those old sitcom episodes where squabbling roommates paint a line down the middle of their apartment. It's important that everybody up there can work together, regardless of their nationality or culture. 
It's also important that the space agencies and governments down here on the ground supporting them can work together too. So while the ISS may play a big part in the future of humanity, it also plays a part in promoting peace and cooperation on Earth today. I think it's pretty significant. I think, well, first of all, you realize that everything that's ambitious now, it happens at an international level and we need cooperation. Uh, it's very, very difficult to do ambitious things such as, you know, send humans to, uh, uh, to the moon, send humans to Mars uh, without international cooperation. So we'll need everybody to unite and to contribute something to a common endeavor. That's one. And then second, it's obviously not easy, you know, to, to, to agree because um, people are different, obviously, even for us within Europe, uh, we have to agree on, you know, anything before before we bring it up to the, the ISS partnership. So that's that's two levels um, of reaching an agreement. That's, that's not easy, but what it does, I think, is it forces you to focus on the things you have in common rather to focus on, on your differences. And that's great. And that's what we need. That's why we need, you know, corporations like the ISS that are hugely visible for everybody to see. And so that it forces the countries to, to contribute. It's very, very easy to disagree. Uh, people are different all over the planet. Everybody has their own interests and priority. It's not always easy to cooperate. So we need to we need to be an example for this. We need to set an example, and we need to force people to think about what they have in common rather than their differences. And that's what the ISS does every day. So, what does the future hold for the International Space Station? How much longer will this global partnership last? And what's the next big thing we're going to build in space? We'll cover all that on the next episode of Seeker Plus. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss it, and leave a comment with what you think our next series should be about. We could talk about motorsports or medieval forts or John Cena's jean shorts. Really doesn't matter. Just let us know. I'm Julian, and I'll see you next time on Seeker Plus.